Hello everyone. Thank you organizers for inviting me uh, to this conference. It is a big pleasure and of course a big challenge to talk about the museum in the museum. I will talk about public engagement in art museums. And in the beginning, uh, I have to say some words about the very term, public engagement. In the museum's field, this term is often related to the activities of some certain departments, such as education department or marketing department, guided tours, gallery talks, lectures, workshops, and similar programs implemented by this department are, of course, important part of contemporary museum's agenda. However, many researchers show that the vast majority, or more than 90% of museum visits, occur without human mediation. As Douglas Wards puts it, most people graze through exhibits, spending only seconds looking at any individual works. Educational activities may help to establish focus and generate reflection and dialogue. But, he adds, a cynic might question the use of exciting programs that accommodate a very small and select audience, and which are laid on top of exhibitions that, on their own, are poor communicators and facilitators of individual reflection and public dialogue. One can even see that successful educational programs might play a compensatory role that enables a sacred cow of traditional art museums, which mean the art displays, to be preserved in a form which is largely dysfunctional, end of thought. Keeping this in mind, in my presentation I will, I will not focus on educational or similar programs which surrounds museum displays, but we'll talk about the broader pro problem of public engagement in art museums, relating it more to the politics of the museum and to the issues of display making. Public engagement, audience empowerment, involvement of communities, and similar terms mark the shift in museums' relationship with society, which has taken place since the late 70s in Western museums and is a result of general cultural and political changes, as well as a sign of professionalization of the very institution of the museum. Today, different forms of public participation in museum practice, including crowdsourcing, story sharing, and exchange with amateurs, are quite common in advanced history museums, ethnography museums, and science centers. Participatory approach led these museums to break with production of authoritative narratives and to employ multiple perspectives and interactive mode of communication. The concept of public participation is more problematic within the field of art museums. It seems that production and perception of the art museum's contents require more expertise and specialist knowledge and deep engagement of non-professionals here is impossible. But at the same time, art museums, like other types of museums, are obliged to be relevant to the lives of wider and more diverse audiences than the art professional ones, or the lives of so-called old party. A vast literature about public participation in museums can be divided into two groups. Some authors, sheer enthusiasm, about the very concept of participation as inherently democratic. The most prominent among them is Nina Simon, American museum practitioner, a famous blogger and writer. In her groundbreaking book, The Participatory Museum, she speaks about different forms of participatory models, drawing on the examples mostly from history, ethnography, and science museums. But she also analyzes in depth some participatory projects run by art museums. For example, the first crowd-created and crowd-curated art exhibition in major museum called CLIC and organized by Brooklyn Museum in 2008. As uh, Simon says, art museums are well suited for creative visit participation. They show the creative process, and many visitors may be inspired to create their own art in response to that on display and unfold. Among successful projects, she analyzes creative involvement of visitors in the exhibitions where people uh, uh, are encouraged to create their own artworks uh, um, 
after examples or the activities of community galleries established in art museums, such as Picasso Museum in Barcelona. She stresses that art museums usually have a lot of opportunities to collaborate with participatory artists who run highly involving public projects. But among challenges for art museums to engage with their public, she mentions that art museums have more significant separations between education departments and curatorial departments than any other types of museums. Nina Simon analyzes and propagates different forms of participation. The authors who are more interested in the contents and the meaning of participation as such are more skeptical about this idea. For example, Stuart Birch analyzes the concept of participation and its limits with a reference to the book called Participation and Democratic Theory by Carolyn Heitman from 1970. According to Birch, rarely art museums implement fully participatory projects. Then participation of audiences is somehow limited or the final decisions are taken by the museum, we can speak only about partial participation or even pseudo-participation. As Birch put it, participation always is a matter of degree in the court. Among other examples uh, taken mostly from Scandinavian national art museums, he speaks about an open storage system, a quite radical form of breaking the hierarchy of traditional museum structure. Making collections available for society uh, can transfer the role of a curator or the museum, uh, or, or offer from the museum to its visitors and users. But Birch calls an open storage system only an instance of partial participation, as the public's involvement is limited to responding to already existing and predetermined collection and of vote. A matter of acquisition is totally in the hands of a museum, and the authority of museum is usually left unquestioned by the society. The museum presents its collecting practices as naturalized, usually remaining silent about any issues of acquisition, such as selection, debates, negotiations, and so on. Stuart Birch understands the problem of public participation in art museums in the context of participatory democracy and emphasizes such criteria as equality, agency in decision making, and so on. It means that he sees the participation as a relatively new concept, which is thinkable in the current political system. I would like to relate the concept of participation not with the current political climate, but with the history of museum institution, which dates back to private collections called curiosity cabinets in the 16th and 17th century. Cabinets of curiosity differed from what we know now as modern museums, not only because they were a very elite affair, but also by their structure and purpose. Cabinets contained an eclectic type of collection, that is, they deliberately mixed and juxtaposed categories such as natural and artificial, antiquarian and new. The main criteria to include something into a collection was, this, was its curiosity, be it a characteristic of the thing, rare, uncommon, singular thing, and so on, or an attitude of the collector, to quote Krzysztof Pomian, a desire to see, learn, or possess those things which have a special relationship with the totality and consequently provide a means for attaining it." End of quote. The core of the cabinet was a conversation among the owner of the collection and his guests. The conversation, the a curious thing, gave an opportunity to inspire dialogue and provided an imaginary access to other times and to other places. So the cabinets became a special way to understand history and surrounding world through telling stories related to the curious things. That's why today there are a lot of authors calling for a return to curiosity, and these authors, some of them, emphasizes the existential and participatory aspect integral to the cabinet of curiosities that seem to be more or less lacking in the present day museum. 
This call to return to curiosity is in fact a call for a different way of construction of knowledge, which might be used in the art museums as well. And in the rest of my paper, I'll try to outline three broad ideas which might be helpful in rethinking participation in art museums relating it to the concept of curiosity. First idea, let's call it a transgression of art historical discourse, uh, as you read in uh, uh, the quotation from Michel Foucault, the channels are too narrow. Uh, in traditional art display, uh, the knowledge is understood as a definite body of facts. The objects are testimonies of disciplinary discourses, to quote Mark O'Neill. This is a discourse-oriented display, and it might be relevant to professional interests of rather small group of visitors. <coughs> By contrast, visitor-oriented display usually presents expanded contextualization of artworks. For example, it might be an attempt to contextualize art within visual culture. For example, exhibiting of film, literature, design works alongside works of visual art, according to Claire Bishop, led to ground artworks in social and political history rather than an art historical discourse of formal innovation. Such contextualization pose questions related to common human questions of history, memory, identity, which are linked to people's cultural background rather than narrow specialist interests. The other, more radical way to transgress a narrow art historical discourse in art displays is to involve a public in the process of display, of construction of display. And a widely discussed example here might be mentioned, a collaborative project between the university and the museum which resulted in a collaborative permanent display of historical paintings in the Lang Art Gallery called Non Spirit. The museum's collection of historical paintings mostly depict the regional landscape. Therefore, the team of researchers adopted the concept of identity connected to the land as a trigger to investigate people's relationship with the territory and to share authority when developing the display. If panel were written by museum staff and provided knowledge about the history of the region and its artists, interactive devices play audiovisual recordings of local people telling the story of how they perceive the places shown in pictures. <coughs> Their personal memories become a source of knowledge and offer it to visitors to make meaning of the artworks and the places encourage personal associations with the stories narrated and the subjects of the collection. This strategy can, has opened up the possibility to give a voice to people's personal memories and to make, I quote, visible different types of knowledge, usually held apart intellectually and physically in museums and galleries, end of quote. In both cases, the transgression of art historical discourse is related to public participation, but not to participation as a concept per se, but in order to empower the audience to actively construct their own personally relevant meanings from artworks in relation to their personal experiences. As Mark O'Neill puts it, visitors are in this way engaged in a continuous process of discovery, both of the objects and themselves. That validates their own understandings, encouraging curiosity. Second idea relates social engagement with a style of art display. How? In which way to tell the story of art? Talking about the style of the display or hang, usually there is a debate between those who argue for the chronological display and those who advocate relatively new mode of thematic display. Chronological displays are mostly criticized for their false objectivity for their unrealizable attempt to tell the story as it was, and for their narrow focus on formal achievements. Thematic displays allow greater opportunity to transgress the borders of narrow art historical discourse, relating different artworks under broader cultural topics. But it is also criticized for its apolitical approach to history. And here I am interested in the third way, not in a mixture of these two types, but in a little bit 
different approach. And uh, here is culture theorist Mickey Ball, uh, who points that both these principles, chronological and thematic, produce predictable content. They are too unsurprising, hence leaving no space for curiosity. Drawing on the exhibition partners, it is not permanent display, it was just temporary exhibition curated by the artist and collector. Uh, she describes the narrative style display as alternative to both chronological and thematic displays. I quote, a narrative exhibition asks of the viewer that she establishes connections as she moves through the exhibition, building up a story which has as its outcome an effect. This effect binds together the different experiences evolving from the confrontation with the artworks and the quote. She says that the narrative of exhibition is like the narratives in the novels or films where the effect is achieved by means of a specifically narrative rhetoric and poetical figures, such as emphasis, contrast, counterpoint, reiteration, etc. Traditional art displays, which usually looks like endless rows of art objects of the same significance, are constructed as logic persuasion. Instead of it, Mickey Ball proposes affective interaction, saying that the primary task of exhibition is to, I quote, to encourage visitors to stop, suspend action, let affect invaders, and then quietly, in temporary respite, think and report. And, 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 and report. If the juxtaposition of outwardly disconnected things produce the pleasure of curiosity in the historical cabinets, the narrative model of exhibiting might become a new way to engage visitors. But telling an engaging story is telling a story in person. And here I turn to the third idea that's an idea of a museum as a living organism. Since the end of 17th century, the private collections of curiosities have been gradually transformed to the public museums of different disciplines. The process of disciplinary classification in modern museums took, took place along with an attempt to create a display without an author. To quote Stephen Ban, the authority of the museums was vested in the objectivity of history itself. Curiosity, by contrast, presumes a display as a subjective act of storytelling. As we know now, an attempt to speak in the name of the history was one of the utopias of modernity. But we still may encounter the marks of this utopia in the majority of art museum displays, unnamed, unsigned, organized and presented as timeless narrative. But the museum is a living organism with its roots and the story of its creation, with the twists and turns of its history, with people, names, and complex stories of acquisition behind every piece of its collection, with real, although unnamed authors of its displays, etc. Museums are made by people and affected by the changes around them. The problem is that the modern museum hides its complex nature and thus creates barriers for engaging dialogue with its publics. The critics who have problematized the impersonal and isolated self-image of museums have also pointed to the necessity of a self-reflection of the museum. Self-reflection in museum discourse means that what is exposed is the museum itself. It might be instances of institutional transparency, such as showing original kernel of museum's collection exploration of the history of collection, for example, recreating exhibitions from the past, critical exposition of acquisitions, which are always a matter of authorial negotiations and selections. And an example here have, can be mentioned, uh, the project Games and Players, implemented by Van Arbe Museum in the Netherlands. It also might be authorization of museum labels and panels as, as we know, all interpretations are subjective and their authors should be identified. In order to emphasize a subjective nature of museum work, it might be a preference, for example, for a discourse with question marks instead of assertive statements. 
and so on and so on. What about Lithuanian art museums? Maybe find any forum of self-reflection or attempt to engage more with their publics, by the publics. Of course, uh, there are examples. As an example, I may mention a project by the National Art Gallery, where we are now. Uh, we are different professionals. We are invited to lead their own tours through a permanent display of the gallery presenting diverse versions of the same narrative and pointing to the arbitrary nature of the narrative as such, though I'm not sure about its usability of this project and records, and uh, do visitors uh, use uh, it somehow. Or I may mention a book called Collection Stories, a book published by the National uh, Chivalonius Museum of Art, uh, which followed the exhibition dedicated to the 90th anniversary of the museum as an attempt to understand the history of the museum through the stories of its collection. But there is a lot of to do in the future. And for the conclusion, I'm a person from university, not from the museum. And uh, one may often hear the opinion that there is a huge gap between the day-to-day -day practice of museum work and all these ideas, also idea of public engagement, coming mainly from theory, academy, and also from rich and advanced world museums. And there is a lot of truth in such criticism. However, it is difficult to agree with it totally. Uh, three years ago, me and my colleagues from the university uh, made a research about communication of cultural institutions and we use their sociological method of focus groups. The material from focus group of museum's audiences clearly showed us that people expect the museums to be a place of participation. The most striking thing for them is not an authority of the institution, nor its significant professionally prepared content, but the relevance to their lives and problems, affective stories and touching experiences, and possibility to connect with the inner life of museum. So the ideas of public engagement is not only theory, but also the expectations of museum audiences. And art museums, being public institutions, will have to fulfill these expectations one way or another. Thank you.